So just to clarify, I had a difficult journey. It took me 36 hours to get here, but what happened was I was late getting to Montreal. So I had a, the, and so I missed my flight and I, I had to come the next day, which meant I had a free day in Montreal, Care of Air Canada. And so I, had, I went to the Musée des Beaux-Arts, I went, had delicious dinner, I walked around the old city. That's what everybody's been saying I'm so sorry about. <laughs> so it was fantastic and I'm, I'm so glad to be here. So I have a question. I actually gave a talk in Toronto on US election day. Who was at that from this audience? Oh good, only a half. Yeah, so it was, it was a epochal day in the history of our nation. And I was reassuring everybody, of, oh yeah, don't worry about it, I'm gonna get back in time to vote and blah, blah, blah. But uh, yeah, so that was a different United States at that moment. Uh, it's something that we're still trying to figure out what it's going to mean for New York City. We have a very progressive administration in New York. Um, and I just wanted to say a couple words about that before I get started. So the actual situation for federal funding in New York, in America, everybody here keeps hearing the end of the National Endowment for the Arts. So there was just what's called a continuing resolution passed by our Congress, uh, which actually gave an increase to the National Endowment for the Arts. And it's not just the National Endowment for the Arts, it's the National Endowment for the Arts, the Humanities, the Institute for Museum and Library Services, and the Corporation for Broad uh, Public Broadcasting. Four major agencies, all slated for complete elimination. I was so envious, by the way, of your Canada Council Chair having to figure out how to do with doubling the funding and how was he going to do it. It's such a difficult problem. Um, so congratulations to you on that. I do not think that our National Endowment for the Arts or those other agencies will be eliminated, but there is big question about whether they will be cut under this administration or not. But more fundamental to that, for our budget in, in New York City, is the other budgets, the housing budget, the education budget, which could have tremendous effect on New York City's budget, which by the way, could then create the necessity to cut all other agencies, including culture. So we're very worried about what happens in the fall with the actual federal budget, but I don't think that the you know, focus just on the National Endowment for the Arts, I think that the worry for the arts is what happens to the entire federal budget. And there's a lot of conflict. If anybody from the political sector wants to understand how that might play out, I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards. Um, the other thing to say is that the biggest chunk of funding for the arts in the United States at the federal level is not those agencies. It's the Smithsonian Institution, which dwarfs those agencies. And this is what you might call direct funding, where there's a bunch of institutions, plus the National Gallery, by the way, in Washington that get 900 million or a billion dollars of funding, which hasn't been threatened at all. So I think sometimes the public discourse um, misses the point a bit. Uh, the other thing is that the basic way that, that arts and culture are, are funded in the United States is tax structure, when you have a very similar tax structure. I've been talking to people about that today. Um, when I go and talk in Europe about how the arts are supported, I say one of the things we have is you know, this tax deductibility. And I understand also there may be some changes, I guess, from uh, province to province here in Canada in relationship to things like property taxes. Are there people in this room, uh, arts organizations, that pay some property tax? Yeah, so that, very few. So I've, I've been trying to figure this out. Some do, that never happens in the United States. So that's another way that, so property tax would not be paid by a nonprofit cultural institution. Okay. So I wanted to talk um, a little bit, I'm gonna get to where I'm at as the Department of Cultural Affairs Commissioner. By the way, after the federal government, New York City is the next largest funder of arts and culture in the United States. And we have a budget between our capital and expense of about $320 million a year. That sounds like a lot of money, it's a lot, a very big city. Uh, but by American standards, that's a tremendous amount of money. There's only one other American city that per capita spends more which is San Francisco, which is based on a hotel tax. But that's a city one twelfth the size of New York. So how did I get to where I am? I'm going to talk about that for a minute. OK, so I fast forward. I was an artist. I became an arts administrator. I wasn't a very good artist. I figured that out at a very early age. I was you know, getting into shows sort of like by my own tenacity rather than people like hounding me to get into the show. So I, at a certain point, realized I was kind of better at this other thing. 
I became a curator at PS1 Contemporary Arts Center where I worked for 12 years. Um, I ran an arts colony called Skalhiga, but eventually ended up running a museum in Queens. So Queens is a very special space. This is what the museum looks like now. Queens is the most culturally diverse place in New York City and one of the most culturally diverse places in the United States. Um, if you look at Queens, it is divided almost equally between the races that we identify, which are not inclusive, I would say, um, but also extremely diverse within, let's say, the Asian community and the uh, Latino community. So in the, uh, on the right, you see that there were 511,000 uh, Asians, but you know, it's Chinese, uh, Indian, Korean, Filipino, Bangladeshi, etc. So it was this amazing place to be. Um, and when I arrived at the Queens Museum, it was, you know, a kind of a beautiful museum with one incredible asset, which was a scale model of New York City, about twice the size of this room. So we actually had an attraction that brought tens of thousands of people to the museum. But we didn't have, um, and by the way, I just wanted to say, I don't know why I even put this slide in, because you know this, right? Um, that some of the diversity questions that I'm going to be talking about are just very quite similar to Canadian questions, obviously. Anyway, I, I, I don't know, I felt somehow obliged to show you that I knew that. <laughs> all right, you guys know all this stuff. Okay, so then, so the question is, arriving at this very diverse place, in a city that's very diverse, the most diverse part of the most diverse city in America, in the United States, what are we gonna do about it? And the most obvious thing, which has actually been done for quite some period of time already at the Queens Museum, was let's do um, you know, shows relevant to those communities. So this is a show about Mexico City called ABCDFV, which was, came from Mexico City with Mexican curators. The Mexicans who live in Queens are not actually from Mexico City, but they're from Pueblo, which is quite nearby. They identify with Mexico City. So we did these shows, and, we, you know, and this is a kind of a common uh, idea. Let's do shows that are quite diverse and show the people that live around. And this is kind of what I call the outreach model, uh, which is to say, we actually don't have any Mexicans on our staff yet. We will, I'll get to that in a minute. But outreach implies out and reach, right? So you're in and they're out and we're gonna reach out. And I think it's an incomplete model, but it's not a bad model, and it cre created some momentum in the right direction. Uh, we had the biggest Tibetan community in the United States by far in Jackson Heights. Thousands of Tibetans, so we did a contemporary Tibetan show, which actually was quite controversial with the Chinese, you know, down the street in some other ways. But, um, you know, and, and we actually, there were uh, videos that came right out of Lhasa for that show. It's a beautiful show. Uh, there's a lot of amazing stuff being done by contemporary artists, and some of the most famous contemporary artists from Tibet live in Queens, right down the street in Jackson Heights. So this was another of those shows. But so then one of the things that we realized was that sort of the, the context within which we were working was still the box of the museum. And we, um, at a certain point, were hiring our next outreach coordinator, and we were interviewing a bunch of people. And a woman came in who seemed completely at some level unqualified to work at the museum. She was a community organizer. And I don't know if you have that exact title. Do you have that in, in Canada? Do you have community organizers? No, okay, so I'll describe what a community organizer. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, you got them, okay, yeah, yeah. So what do community organizers do? Yes. Did everybody hear that? So it's actually a horizontal model, right? Which is about networking and asking people what they want. There were, there were a famous book uh, called Rules for Radicals, or and then Reveille for Radicals by Saul Olinsky, who was sort of the guy who, uh, he didn't invent community organizing, but he sort of solidified it in the 1960s. So that idea that you are um, listening, actively listening. So this woman was a community organizer and a political organizer. And I'd never done this before or since, but we were interviewing her, and everybody else who came in was sort of this artsy, you know, I'm very interested in art from one, you know, artist, et cetera. So we asked this woman, you know, just sit down here, we're gonna leave the interview for 15 minutes, come up with a, like a sketch of a plan uh, to be a community organizer in Corona, Queens. And so we, we left and came back, and she's like, ah, oh, she's got on her Blackberry, and she said, you know, I'm gonna connect 
to the parents, through the kids. Because, you know, you go to schools and talk to the kids and you're gonna meet the parents and you're gonna build trust through that. Obviously this woman needed to be fluent in Spanish because 90% of the people on that side of the park were Spanish speaking. So she was actually Afro-Colombian, fluent Spanish speaking, political organizer, community organizer. And we say, okay, you got the job. This is great, congratulations. And that moment was in a moment in a process in which we felt we were going from the outreach model to the community engagement model. So one of the things that happened not long after that is that we discovered the incredible possibility of a plaza nearby the Queens Museum. It's called Corona Plaza on 103rd and uh, Roosevelt Avenue, if you ever want to go visit it. Um, we started doing some programming there, and we were doing programming related to um, uh, folks who lived there. It was uh, sort of culturally specific often. These um, festivals would play out in Spanish almost exclusively. But one of the things that we were, we were sort of thinking about this in terms of the panel this morning was, what are the traditions, the social traditions of consuming art within a particular community? And there's a, an interesting uh, book called uh, Magical Urbanism by a guy named, uh, uh, last name of Davis, I'll think of his name in a second. But, um, so he was talking about the, what is called the Latin Americanization of American public space in cities, right? So one of the things that if you go and travel to Latin America, you're going to find a lot of action happens in plazas, right? If you go to Mexico City, you go to these cities. So we said, all right, hey, you know, we're kind of learning what we're doing here. So we started working, we've done, uh, the Queens Museum has done probably now hundreds of programs in this plaza. And by the way, the plaza then, when attention came to the plaza, got renovated. And uh, this is actually after the first renovation, which was just sort of closing down a street and putting this sort of white pebbles to make it kind of cool public space, it's now undergoing a multi-million dollar renovation based on a really intensive community design project, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit. But, so I wanted to say, if you look at this, there's kind of three different things happening in the foreground, middle ground, and background of this picture. So in the foreground, you got a really cool thing, which is a, <clears throat> a mobile library put together by some hipster artists from another part of Queens called Uni, and that you see that they, um, sort of improvised on that very hot day and went off and bought paracels so everybody could sit there. And these are families sitting there and reading books in English and Spanish. The second um, circle, we got to know, uh, we're, I was talking to some folks after the presentation this morning, that there are, the indigenous population of that part of Queens was actually uh, Quechua people from the Andes. So these are folks who are First Nation people who have, who are Quechua speaking from three or four different countries, particularly Ecuador, Peru, um, Ecuador, Peru, and what is it? There's one other country, um, Bolivia. So we had a, an interesting relationship with, with that group, and that group began to sort of per, um, perform quite often. But also, there's a festival called the Inti Raimi. I don't know if people know what that is, but it's a festival of the sun that Quechua speaking, and there are different Quechua languages, folks um, perform. And that was performed for the community. It wasn't a public event, but it was something we helped produce. Anyway, so there, it, you see the kind of hipster artist thing, the uh, Andean dancing. And then back here in the back <clears throat> were these kind of social activist, like, um, we, found that, we found out that the Corona, Queens, this particular part of Queens, was the place where people were least likely to avail themselves of services that they were entitled to of any place in New York City. And the reason for that is that there were a very large number of undocumented New Yorkers living there. So in the context of arts and cultural presentation, which was a mix of all different kinds of stuff, People felt relaxed and came out into public space, and then we could connect them to activist organizations, immigration organizations, or even governmental organizations, like people weren't getting food stamps. And these are people who needed food stamps, who deserve food stamps. Even if you're undocumented in New York City, you can get food stamps, you can get health uh, services, etc. So this was a model to say, let's move outside of the box of the museum, let's connect to the community. Uh, a next step of this, I guess, um, 
was to think about you know, social action in relationship to contemporary art. And I think I have to speed up here because I could talk about this stuff for hours and I want to get to some other issues. Okay, this is a project by an artist named Tanya Bergera. It's called Immigrant Movement. It was, it's a social space, which is a social art project right near Corona Plaza there in the community. It's been going on for five and a half years. Um, and it's kind of an activist space that's almost always activated around the arts. So there are dance groups that meet there. Everything is free that happens there. This is a group of Dream Act kids, kids who are really Americans who are born in the United States, or not born in the United States, who grew up in the United States, who are not citizens, who are undocumented. So a lot of political action, social action, inclusive action. Um, this is another sort of think tank. This is the uh, great uh, MacArthur winning genius from Houston named Rick Lowe who started Project Row Houses, which if anybody wants to know, I would say the signature uh, social project of, of any in the United States that I know of is Project Row Houses in Houston. So look, write that down and look that up if you haven't heard about it. Anyway, so people like that were coming in from around the country to help us think about uh, social action within the community of Queens. This is an elected official, a city council member, that's Tanya Bergera. Um, we participated in Occupy Wall Street with a march. Okay, so then a very progressive mayor gets elected uh, and appoints me to be Commissioner of Cultural Affairs, something that I resisted for some period of time because people don't like government officials, right? So this is something I didn't really, I, I want people to like me and I wasn't sure I wanted to do this, <clears throat> but I finally succumbed. And by the way, this mayor is very tall. I'm standing on a platform there. <clears throat> Okay, so then now I am commissioner of the Cultural Affairs Department and what do we do at Cultural Affairs? For the one thing, we're the landlord <clears throat> of a bunch of cultural institutions like the Museum of Natural History, the Metropolitan Museum, 33 institutions that comprise about half the cultural life of New York City. So those institutions have an attendance of about 21 million people. Just the Metropolitan Museum has 7 million visitors a year. So these are some of the big ones. Uh, PS1 Contemporary Art Center, where I met my wife long ago, which is sort of the hipster, you know, contemporary art place. I realized, you know, that, that this is, I'm actually a vegetarian and I'm sort of pro-animal activist, blah, blah, blah. We have zoos under our uh, umbrella. Most of what the zoos and the aquariums do is very animal friendly. This is like a terrible slide, I have to change it. But I just wanted to show you that we have, right, isn't that terrible? This is like, this seal is not doing what normally seals do. <laughs> but anyway, it's a popular show at the aquarium. Uh, in any case, we have aquariums, we have gardens, um, and we have some of the smaller art centers under our portfolio. We also f fund about a thousand other organizations in the city. So, confronted with this job, you know, there's all this information about how unculturally diverse cultural institutions are at the staff level and the board level. So we looked at some national statistics and the national statistics say that, you know, uh, the United States is becoming more and more diverse uh, as we go forward, you know, from 25 years ago to today to 25 years ahead, we're getting more diverse, but museum staffs are not. So this is a, a study not done by us. This is a national study. So we said, okay, let's do that in New York City. Let's see what the diversity looks like in staffs and boards of cultural institutions. So by the way, this is, you can see this, right? So museum visitors and museum staffs in the United States today are not living up to the diversity of the country already. In New York City, um, so US population today is 30%, 34% minority, so-called minority, New York City, you know, the, the term minority is a joke because it's 65% of New York City. But, and while our um, uh, cultural workforce is much more diverse than the country, it's also much less diverse than New York City. So given the diversity of the city, if everything were equal and all access points were the same, you should have 65% of the staff should be, you know, people of color, right? Um, so, uh, by the way, I also want to just say when we did these diversity statistics, you will see that we didn't include disability, which is, by the way, 10% of New York City, because the information didn't appear on the uh, employment records. So we just dealt with records that already existed. We had 37,000 people uh, in our study. 
Uh, but you know, you're, you're not listed as a person with disability unless you actually ask for an accommodation in the United States. It also doesn't include uh, non-conforming gender, LGBTQ, et cetera. So there are major uh, omissions in this study, which we understand, but I just want to go through it anyway. Okay, so what we said was, within that cultural workforce, what does it look like? So the cultural workforce is 61% black. I was just looking at this absolutely appalling statistic that there are 22,420 white people working at cultural institutions and 88 American Indian slash Alaskan Native as we defined it. Um, but it's worse than that. It's worse than that because what kind of jobs do people have? So if you look at the, this shows uh, on the far left, you know, oh, I'm sorry, this is the bright spots. <laughs> we'll get to the worst part in a minute. Uh, there are certain parts actually of, of the cultural workforce that are better. Um, programming, finance, interestingly enough, is, is pretty diverse. Um, and then, but if you look at uh, the trajectory of junior versus senior staff, um, that, and by the way, this is a little bit hard to, to read, do you understand? So these are bigger numbers, but the percentages, so 56% of junior staff is white, 67% of uh, mid-level, and 73% of senior staff. And by the way, this survey includes all the organizations of color in New York City. This is not just a survey of the big institutions. The survey said that the big institutions are less diverse than the little institutions. But when you get to the uh, question of what, people, what kind of pe jobs people have, oh, hold on. Ah, I'm missing a slide, where is that? Uh, okay. Um, the whitest job in the entire sector is curator. The least white jobs are maintenance and security, right? So as bad as those statistics look, it's much worse than that. And I think that, you know, I don't know what these statistics are like in, in Canada, but I would guess that they're not necessarily any better. And I could guess that partially by looking around this room, but also just by having been to Canadian cultural institutions. So, and by the way, I'm very hesitant to say anything because we um, in America, in the United States, have to just shut up right now about just about everything, right? We cannot be telling <laughs> Canadians how to do stuff. I'm very aware of that, so I'm gonna try to not do it. Um, but I did have to make that one comment. All right, so I don't know, so this is, these are appalling statistics, right? This was something we have to do, something about this. So certainly even just doing this survey began to help. But I also wanted to say that, that one of the things that's been done in New York City at some level, there are some institutions that are, uh, are well-funded organizations of color. So for example, the Studio Museum in Harlem. And, and I just wanted to show this slide. I happened to take it at a, an opening. So this is Thelma Golden. She's the director of Studio Museum in Harlem. She's involved right now in a capital campaign where she is personally raising tens of millions of dollars for the new building. We're going to put a bunch of money into this also. But it was interesting, I didn't even notice until later. Anybody know who that is? Canadian guy? Glenn Lowry, okay. And this is uh, Adam Weinberg. So Adam Weinberg runs the Whitney. Uh, Glenn Lowry runs the Museum of Modern Art. So yeah, so these are two really powerful, some of the most powerful people in New York City in the arts and culture world are there hanging out at an opening at Studio Museum in Harlem and Thelma's gonna go walk over to them. And so she has been a seed for curators of color all over the country. And so th she thinks of her place as a pipeline of excellent curators. So there are curators at, at the Museum of Modern Art, at the Art Institute of Chicago, all over the country, African-American curators have been come through Studio Museum. She says to the curators, you're here for five years and then you're out. You're gonna, we're gonna train you, you're gonna do shows, you're gonna, professional development will happen here. She's a very tough mentor. And then you're out. So there is this feeling that supporting organizations of color, by the way, when I first met Thelma, she was a curator at a small African-American organization called the Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning, way out in Southeast Queens. Her boss at the time was a woman named Kelly Jones, who's now a MacArthur winning full professor at Columbia University. Two young African-American women who had the chance at that organization to get the skills to throw them up into the pipeline. But that's a very rare occurrence. So I just wanted to talk about a couple of other things we've done. We have 
perhaps 500,000 undocumented folks living in New York City. And one of the problems is you don't have an ID card, right? You can't get a, a driver's license, you don't have a... So if you come in contact with the police, for example, it's very hard to avoid being arrested if you don't have government-issued ID. If you are trying to visit a government building, visit your kid at school, what do you do? So we, we, not me, the mayor, I'm in this picture, so I'm over here kind of looking like a gangster. This is me. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was a very bright day. Anyway, the mayor, the very tall mayor is in the center there. Um, so what we did, or what the administration did, was start this thing, the municipal ID card. And the municipal ID is something where you can just, if you just prove that you live in New York City and that you are, you know, who you are, then you can get the ID card. So what we said was, let's figure out a way that that will be attractive to everybody in New York City and also make it a kind of cultural equity thing. So we said, we're gonna add a cultural benefit to that. So we talked to our friends in those institutions where we own the building, and we said, how about giving free memberships to everybody who has this card? So they did. So we have now um, delivered to New York City. A million people have this card. So that was uh, the, the next most successful card in the United States, 1% of the population of Oakland, California. So when we were rolling this out to the cultural institutions, we said, eh, you know, probably be 2 or 3% because we're going to do much better. It's like now more than 10% of the city. And 500,000 free memberships to cultural institutions have been given away with that card. And large concentrations of those are, of course, in the very affluent communities, but other large concentrations are, and we don't know who's who, but in communities like Corona, Queens, like Jackson Heights, like Sunset Park, Brooklyn, where there are large numbers of undocumented immigrants. So we feel that this is a great equity push to hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers, or million. Um, I'm gonna skip through a little bit of this. Yes? Is there a risk that unfriendly forces could get that list? Ah, uh, Jim, uh, <laughs> let's not, I'll tell you a bit later, yeah. So what happened is, so we had a provision in the law that said if there was any threat that the federal government would want to get their hands on the list, we would destroy all the documentation. That was in the law, and say, all right, we're getting ready to, there was an election, getting ready to destroy them, and there's a lawsuit by some Republican Congress people to stop us from destroying the information, which I think is not gonna happen. I think we're gonna lose, we're gonna win the case. But you could imagine the trust that would be broken with our citizens if we said, just sign up, it's gonna be okay. So I think it's gonna be okay. We're at the stage where we've won you know, almost every stage. And so the plan is, as soon as we win the case, destroy the information. No, uh, so what we did are doing now is we're collecting all the information to verify you are who you are, you get the card, at which point your, all your information is destroyed. Or, yeah, so, but ugh. <laughs> See, getting to the point, isn't that interesting that Jim caught that right away? How about everybody else in the room? Did you think about that? Oh my God, yes. Yes, so we thought about it, and we thought we had a mechanism. In any case, sorry. I get an extra minute for that, because I got one of the questions, right? Okay. Um, we're uh, really focusing on a f uh, affordability issue for artists in New York City. We want to try to figure out a mechanism to make New York City affordable to allow artists to thrive in place, to not create a mechanism for gentrification, to say, how can we create a mechanism for artist studios and artist housing, we're working on this. We're building a bunch of artist housing and artist studios. It's a good program. You guys have an amazing one up here in Toronto. Um, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about this issue of the question of the pipeline. What we keep hearing as a kind of an excuse from organizations to not hire diverse staffs is, ah, there's nobody in the pipeline. Like we can't, you know, the graduate students are all white, so that's who we're gonna hire. So first of all, I don't think it's true. I think that, in, at least in the United States, there are qualified people of color, and if people were really trying, all people were really trying, then we would have a problem. I don't think people are trying hard enough. I think there are talented people out there that you can find. But we started something called CUNY Cultural Fork. City University of New York is an amazing uh, or, or set of colleges with 250,000 undergraduates. This is a sample, a representative sample. We gave out 80... Um, paid internships to these students. Unpaid internships are a mechanism of inequality. Every time you open the door for an unpaid internship, you are closing the door for somebody who can't afford it. So I'm against, we shouldn't be doing it. Many, many cultural workers in the United States 
get their start as unpaid interns. It doesn't work for low-income people. So this is a, a program. We're hoping to keep it going forever. Uh, any CUNY student could apply, by the way. You could be white or black or anything. 96 or 95% of the kids turned out to be kids of color, just because that's who goes to CUNY. All right. Uh, we have something called Turnaround Arts, which is Michelle Obama's baby. I don't have time to go into it. Uh, we have something building community capacity where we're going to low-income communities and helping communities on a kind of community organizing model to create networks of artists and arts administrators and organizations in those communities. But I want to rush forward to uh, social impact of the arts. We did a study with a group from the University of Pennsylvania. We all know the economic impact of the arts, right? That's been proven over and over again. We believe it in New York City. We have 70 million tourists coming to the city. More than half of them come at least partially for culture. So what about, what is a provable value of the small cultural organization in a low-income community? So there's some the social impact, uh, and this is a, a, a actually a 130-page report, but to encapsulate it, uh, there's a kind of social cohesion that occurs in low-income communities when arts and culture are present. It's not causal, but it's correlation uh, that says that the outcomes in relationship to education, crime, and health are better in, com in, com in co low-income communities that have arts and culture. So this is a way to argue for those communities getting their fair share. Uh, this is the chart. Uh, and then, so then the recommendation is to invest both in communities that have very low, so this is like a real inventory of where arts and culture money is going in the city, which, by the way, tra tracks closely to race and uh, income. So I'll just flip through that, and I want to get to the questions after this one more point, which is, so after this research, after the diversity research, after the social impact research, uh, the city council passed and the mayor signed a law that's requiring us to write a cultural plan. So the cultural plan, we have had 400 meetings with the public. I've been to about 100 of them. We've met 25,000 people in person. We've also met or had input from another 150,000 people online. It's not over yet. We're, I'm sure we're gonna, these numbers are going to go way up. So I'm extremely nervous today because, and this are, people are nervous in New York City. We're going to come out with a document tomorrow uh, which is going to have the recommendations of these 25,000 people we've met. And, you know, some of the recommendations are you have to invest more in low-income communities. You have to properly resource organizations of color. You have to think more carefully about disability when you do your funding. All that with also a recommendation that people care. Guess what? People in New York City care about the Museum of Natural History, the Metropolitan Museum. These are important things for the social, social fabric of New York City. So we have these two kind of contradictory, and by the way, there's 95 recommendations for all kinds of other stuff, but I think that all the press is going to be around the question of equitable distribution of cultural resources in the city. So this is the sort of preview, and the actual cultural plan comes out in July, and then you can read what happens to us at that point. So my hesitation for starting this job, I said at the beginning, was I like people to like me. And I don't think when you do a cultural plan, I don't think that's going to be possible. So if people are already having trouble liking the head of the council as he doubles the budget, just imagine my, my predicament now. So I wanted to, I think we're, <laughs> we're going to do some questions, right? Yeah, OK. So people have any questions or comments? Yeah. So we, um, uh, we spent some time yesterday talking about data, um, and I'm um, incredibly excited about your report and hope you can um, make it possible for us to read, I guess, the first report. Um, but can you talk a little bit about um, what tools you use to measure social cohesion, impacts of the art, arts, in, in, in other words, the non-economic yeah. kinds of markers? Because I know Canada Council is interested in that. People in the research community in general, by yeah. the way, in Canada are very interested in how one quantifies those kinds of impacts. And what so the, the way that that works, so it was, was not done by us, it was done by an independent think tank from the University of Pennsylvania. 
And they created a matrix, and by the way, with private funding, so this is like at arm's length from us at some level, um, they created a matrix of sort of eight levels of thriving communities. And this was based on demographic data that they got both from the city, we, gave, we just opened our books and there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of data points, and also census data from the federal government. So they created these really interesting maps. And you can look online if you just, you know, if you Google Department of Cultural Affairs, New York City, social impact, or something like that, those words. Uh, and these maps began to show how, which communities were thriving, which communities were not thriving. And, you know, of course, the, you know, obviously there was a direct correlation between thriving and the median income of that neighborhood. But there were exceptions. And those exceptions were the interesting part. So where were there parts of the city that had you know, uh, unusual outcomes given the demographics, the income, et cetera. And it turned out that those communities tracked very closely to arts and cultural participation. So that's the, that's the nutshell of it. It's not saying that if you have a low income community with high crime, just put some arts in there and everything's gonna be okay. It's saying part of a thriving community is arts and culture. It's as important as having good schools. It's as important as having a, an effective relationship between the police and the community. So that is what, it's a lengthy report um, with all kinds of academic caveats about the correlation versus causation. But it's really exciting and it's the first time New York City's any, ever had any kind of data like that. When you're trying to change the composition of your staff to be closer to the community, in many universities in the U.S., as I understand it, white students have sued on the basis that they've been deprived a spot based not on merit, that they have the merit, but they don't have the right color. Right. And I'm just wondering what sort of reaction have you had in force-fitting, to some extent, your staff? So I, first of all, when I was at the Queens Museum, my staff was more than 50% people of color, and I'm excluding maintenance and security from that equation. If you included maintenance and security, which, by the way, was largely African-American and Latino, it was maybe 60%. So I, there was a famous uh, football executive in the United States uh, named Art Rooney, and he looked around the league, and he saw that the National Football League was mostly African-American, and there were very few head coaches and general managers, and for the people in that room, the head coach and man general manager are like the executive director and the artistic director of the football team, right? So he said, from now on, when we have a position open, I require you to bring me finalists who are a diverse group. I'm not gonna hire anybody, you know, it's a multi, multi-million dollar operation. Hundreds of millions of dollars are at stake with these two people, the most two important people. So he installed this rule, and quite soon thereafter, they hired this guy, Bobby Tomlins. They won. They've been perennially successful. So that's the model I used. I said to my staff, you must bring me a diverse group of finalists every time, and we're going to hire the best person. And by the way, I have hired plenty of qualified white people. I'm just not, I'm not, there's, you know, some of my best friends are highly qualified white arts administrators. <laughs> I'm not going to back down on that. <clears throat> There are smart and talented white people out there, and I'm going to always have them on my staff. So it's not about that. It's about finding, and by the way, at the Queens Museum, it's also, there are different skill sets if you're a community organizer. And if you're a community organizer, it is not going to be a problem to find somebody who speaks Spanish or speaks uh, Mandarin in, in Queens. So I, I'm absolutely, so then we ended up with a staff that spoke eight languages at the Queens Museum. We ended up with a staff that went to public universities, went to private universities, Ivy League, you know, City College. I think people put way too much uh, stress on looking at a resume. People hire, you know, there's this constant discussion about, you know, bias towards people that are like them, is this person gonna fit in? And, you know, it's like, you know, come on, it's much more interesting to have a staff that's got a lot of different viewpoints. It's more creative, but I will say that we we're talking about taking time there's a lot of, uh, or some research I've read, that it takes more time to make a decision with a diverse staff. You just have to kind of be ready for that. But I've found it to be more than 50% of Department of Cultural Affairs is people of color right now at, in New York City. Um, I have 
two deputy commissioners, one is African American, one is Latino. I mean, it's, it's you can do it. it. There are talented people out there and you can do it in a way that's legal and does not exclude people on the basis of race. How um, best do you make the argument at a governmental level about the uh, importance of centrality of arts and culture in a situation where there are huge economic, uh, social uh, demands on uh, a, a, a finite budget? People like Arlene Goldbard and Karen Atlas have been making these arguments for a long time, and I just wonder how do you, uh, in, uh, in the city, uh, you know, apples and oranges, how do you manage that? Yeah, so, I mean, I, look, in New York, it's very easy to make the argument, first, just on an economic basis, because of the 70 million tourists and all the money that they bring in. But I don't, I think the thing is that it, it first of all, by the way, half of, more than half of our city council is people of color. They are also, so they're kind of embracing the whole diversity thing, so there's not a problem there. But I just, look, we did a public opinion survey, which is gonna come out sometime this week, and I'm not gonna give the whole thing away, but 97% <clears throat> of New Yorkers, and this is conducted by an actual scientific, Siena did the, the research, 97% of New Yorkers believe that arts and culture are an important part of New York City. And by the way, someone said that's within the margin of error of 100%, right? that people really do get it. And I don't think it's that way around the United States necessarily. I don't know what, how that would come out in a Canadian city, but people get it. People get it on all these different levels and people want more. So the argument is how to get more. I mean, we do have the largest arts and cultural budget of any city in America, but people, a lot of people think it's inadequate, including Karen Atlas, who you just mentioned. Um, hi. Uh, you mentioned earlier that larger institutions are often less diverse than smaller institutions. In the, the research that you, you've done in, in, in your city, uh, were there clear uh, rationale in terms of what the difference, why the differences are between the large and the small, and what are the recommendations besides just saying, do a better job, um, that are you offering to those organizations? So we... Um, first of all, the answer to the first part of your question is no. So we don't really have a, any research that says why the bigger cultural organizations are uh, less diverse. Although, I mean, I think, you know, the bigger cultural organizations tend to be the older cultural organizations. Those uh, come from the city, you know, the Metropolitan Museum is a 19th century institution. A great international institution that I love very much, but I mean, it is the um, smaller organizations are often born at a time in New York City as New York City became much more diverse. And New York City, by the way, became much more diverse after the immigration laws in the United States changed in the 60s, and then it changed a lot in the 70s. So a lot of the organizations that are, are you know, primary function is to serve communities of color are, are quite new and much smaller. So I think that's one, Jennifer, but that's my own Anecdotal, that's not scientific. So we've been doing uh, trainings. We have been doing uh, uh, follow-up diversity focus groups to understand what it is, for example, how people feel included or don't feel included. Artists of, or people of color who actually have jobs, do they feel included? And if so, if not, how can we? So we're in the process of doing these kind of trainings and we're gonna do a lot more of those. But it's not necessarily solved the problems. I'm also not convinced that having a diversity plan at an institution necessarily makes the institution more diverse. I don't know if people have seen any studies uh, quantifying that, but I'm not sure. But it's also something we're encouraging. Are we out of time? Yeah, okay. Thank you so much. I love being here, and thank you so much.